Hmm. And Jesus warns in the Gospel of Luke, and it's repeated in the book of Acts, chapter uh, chapter 2, that there will be signs in the heavens. And a lot of people are going to be seeing things in the skies in the last days. The Bible says that in prophecy. So we need to know what the truth is, what to believe and what not to believe, because I think that uh, evil spirits are going to use that to manipulate people in the last days. Recently, there have been quite a few government officials and decorated military personnel like Lou Elizondo or Chris Mellon, as well as the director of NASA, Bill Nelson, revealing that they have not only had unusual encounters with UAPs, but they also believe that they could be intelligences from outside this world, even outside our galaxy. For more information on this, see my documentary called Starfall on this channel. Today, we are going to assume that you've already caught up with this news and we will dive straight into what the Bible says about this topic with our special guest speaker, Doug Batchelor, who is an author, director, and televangelist. Pastor Batchelor is also the pastor of Granite Bay Hilltop Church in California, from where he broadcasts three global television shows and a syndicated national radio show Sunday evenings called Bible Answers Live. Thanks, Pastor, for being on the show tonight. Well, thank you, Brad. Look forward to it. Uh, appreciate the opportunity. The Bible has some rather difficult to understand books, like Revelation and Ezekiel, and your ministry Amazing Facts specializes in these topics and provides material to many different denominations. So I'm excited to ask you some of these more difficult questions tonight. Let's jump right into it. Bill Nelson has mentioned that NASA is now looking for alien life. Did God create life on other planets, and do you think we'll find any? Well, I do believe there's life on other planets. Um, I believe there's other worlds based on some uh, verses you see in the Bible. Uh, This is not when you you look at the size of space and the immensity of what little we can see of space right now. Uh, I think that um, an Australian national university said that there are about 70 million, million, million other stars out there in the the known universe. And that's about... um, 10 times as many stars as grains of sand in all the beaches and deserts of all the world. So, you know, that's, you just think about how many grains of sand would be on just the Sahara. So, you know, it's a, it's a flabbergasting number. And the idea that the only place that God created life was on this very small speck of the cosmos. But you read in the Bible, it tells us, for example, in Hebrews chapter one, verse two, It says, in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he made the worlds. And it's definitely plural there in the Greek. There's other worlds that he's made. And then you read the same book, Hebrews 11, verse 3. By faith, we understand the worlds were formed. So for this reason and many others, I think that, um, yeah, there is life on other planets. Do you think... um they would ever come to our earth and reveal themselves to us? Well, technically they already have. And I got to qualify that, you know, people, when, when a pastor says that alien life has come to earth, you know, automatically think of ET or, <laughs> or, you know, some Martian or some alien, but um, you know, the Bible's clear from cover to cover about angels, which you would call in you know, a life that are otherworldly. They do come to our world. And uh, many times in biblical history, they've interacted. And it's not just the Christian religion. Uh, Islam, Judaism, um, not just the monotheistic religions of the world, but others believe there are these heavenly beings that have come to intercede. And then there's not only the good, there's the bad, the Bible talks about. But So if you're talking about uh, life from other worlds that are in our world, the Bible's very clear on that. But you might be thinking other intelligent creatures that maybe are not engaged or not like angels. And I do think that there's other life out there. Very interesting. Do you think, um, and this is kind of off, uh, off topic, but does the Bible indicate anything that would make them less physical? 
I don't know if I'm describing that right. Yeah, well, I think so. Uh, in Hebrews, it says that angels, for one, are ministering spirits and that man has been made a little lower than the angels. But, um, you know, I think, uh, is it uh, David Attenborough he said one time when someone was asking him about God, wondered if he was an atheist, he said, I'm not an atheist. He said, I don't know how you can be an atheist. He said, I might be an agnostic. But he said, for us to say there is no God, he said, it's like a termite standing on a, the top of his anthill and saying, I now understand the world. He said, our view of the, of the earth is so small and our view of the cosmos is so small that it would be really arrogant to say, I can declare that there's nothing else out there. Um, so he said, you know, you must accept there's a lot we don't know. So let's you and I go back, you know, 100 years. If you tried to explain radio waves to people before Marconi, uh, and say that you know messages can travel through the air, we'd say that's witchcraft. Hmm. So now no one even questions for a minute that television and radio and cosmic rays and x-rays and all this is going through the air all the time around us and it's invisible, which helps us believe more that when the Bible says there are, there are creatures, intelligent creatures that live in a realm that we don't fully understand yet. Um, you know, I think if you're being honest, you'd say, well, that, that should be entirely plausible because we don't know very much. Look at how our knowledge has changed in, you know, one generation. Revelation 21.10 says that John had been abducted. As he said, I was carried away in the spirit. And John saw a new Jerusalem descending from the heaven, from the sky. Was John carried away by technologically advanced beings? And is this a giant city? Is, is it describing a UFO? Well, of course, UFO is just an unidentified flying object. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I'm a pilot, and I've encountered many UFOs flying. Sometimes they're later identified. Sometimes you can't tell what it is. So, but we typically think of a spaceship now when people say UFO. Well, this is a, a city in space. And uh, you know, any Star Trek groupie has no problem believing in a city in space. We've got an international space station that theoretically like Lego blocks can keep on growing. So man's got that technology now. Why wouldn't God have that technology? It's, it's, to me, it's a very small thing. Uh, but when John was shown this and he sees the new Jerusalem coming down, he probably didn't leave very far from the earth. In fact, I think one place it says he was on a mountain and um, he's, he sees the city coming down. So um, he is seeing something that's coming down out of heaven to the earth. And um, yeah, the city is um, a flying dwelling place. But yeah, I entirely believe that's possible. You know, you read other places in Revelation, it talks about like Revelation 12, verse nine. It said, um, therefore, um, well, actually verse 12, it says, therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. So the Bible is describing intelligent creatures that can rejoice in heaven or the heavens, which is, you know, plural, it's beyond this earth. It's not just talking about, you know, clouds where angels play harps or something. So yeah, God has creatures out there and um, how they get around probably varies from one creature to another. So when it says he was carried away in the spirit, do you think that was kind of like Paul? I think we're going to talk about that a little later where Paul mm -hmm. said, I'm not sure if I was carried away in my body or if I was carried away in vision, but Either way, I forget where he says that, but we'll come. Yeah, forward. Paul says in, uh, oh, I, th I think it's in uh, First Corinthians, but I could double check. He said, I knew a man who was uh, carried up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot say. And I think that he was in such, he was in either a vision or he was taken bodily and shown things. It, it probably seemed so very real and tangible to him that he couldn't tell whether it was in his body or if it was just a vision that was extremely real. I mean, God can take you in a vision where you can smell, touch, hear, taste, and it's all very real. I guess oftentimes we think of heaven as a place where God lives, but from what I understand, the word means sky or up there somewhere, mm -hmm. which uh, perhaps was the best way the writers of the Bible could understand it. Does the Bible indicate anything about heaven that makes it seem less ethereal and more physical? Yeah, you know, the Lord tells us in uh, John chapter 14, Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. 
in my father's house are many, the word he uses is dwelling places. I think um, some have translated it mansions because we figure if the Lord is making a dwelling place, it's going to be really nice. But he, here he's talking about making a physical dwelling place outside of the planet. He says, I'm going, and then I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, you may be. So he's going to take man from earth to the place where he's prepared these mansions. Ostensibly, this is in the city that God has prepared. And the Bible indicates that after the thousand years or after the millennium, then the new Jerusalem is transported to the earth. And this planet becomes the equivalent of the capital of the cosmos with God himself dwelling with humans who are made in his image. And so you asked about what the substance of other creatures would be like. Um, you know, I think the other intelligent creatures that God has, uh, like angels, are able to communicate using words and think abstract thoughts. I, I don't know that they all look like the octopuses that we see <laughs> or, the, you know, in some of the movies. I think that the producers always try and think of what's the most otherworldly uh, shape or creature that we've seen. And they always go to something like what we've seen on Earth, whether it's some amoeba or an octopus or something. But um, it'll be, I think we're in for a lot of surprises. The Bible says we can't even imagine the things that God's prepared for those that love him. And I think the interaction with these other intelligent beings is going to be very exciting. Mm. Mm -hmm. In 2 Corinthians uh, 12, 2, Paul speaks of being carried away. This is that one I was talking about. Yeah. In, in the, into the third heaven in which he saw inexpressible things. I've heard it often mentioned that this was evidence of Paul's abduction, where he saw different realms. Does the Bible speak of maybe different realms that, that exist as we understand those? Or, or what are your thoughts? Yeah, well, you know, I, abduction always conjures up images of you know, some pirate capturing somebody and carrying them away against their will. Um, you know, when the Lord took Paul and showed him heaven, not just Paul, I mean, he showed things to Ezekiel and Daniel and um, uh, John and Revelation. So when God takes these people, whether physically or whether he takes them bodily and shows them things, um, they're usually very happy to go along and look upon it. You know, I'd be happy to be abducted to the International Space Station. That would be a thrill for me. <laughs> so, uh, but you know, again, the jury's out about whether Paul went bodily. He didn't know himself, so it's hard for us to speculate. Does the Bible say anything about different realms? Uh, different, I, I, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure if I've read anything in the Bible about different realms. Have you? Well, just that, uh, you know, you and I read that um, Paul said there's things that are indescribable and hard to comprehend. Uh, people who have gone into vision, whether they're, you know, modern prophets or uh, biblical prophets, they say that there's no earthly language to describe the things that they saw or did. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Let's see. In Genesis 6, 2, it says that the sons of God went into the daughters of men and had children by them, and that they created heroes of old, men of renown, the Nephilim. Some have speculated that these are aliens that have come down to mate with humans. Does the Bible indicate otherwise? Yeah, that's a, a passage that um, we often get questions about. Usually during the beginning of the year, people say, I'm going to start reading through the Bible. And pretty soon they're in Genesis 6, where it says that uh, the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair and took wives of all whom they chose. And um, then it says, you know, they had children and they were uh, mighty ones or giants. And they say, well, you know, in order for these sons of God, what are they? And people speculate, are they angels, fallen angels? Must be fallen angels. Good angels wouldn't do that. And um, or are they aliens? Um, but actually, the, the term sons of God, people kind of miss a very simple truth. Throughout the Bible, sons of God is also a term that God uses for people that have decided to follow him. An example would be in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. It says, behold, what manner of love the fathers bestowed on us that we should be called sons of God, and that before sons and daughters of God. And so what happened is after Cain, Adam and Eve had two original boys, Cain and Abel. Cain killed his brother. It says Cain took his wife, which is one of his sisters, and he went off, and uh, he started to populate and procreate and 
they lived hundreds of years back then and thousands of children were born. And meanwhile, Adam and Eve had another son named Seth and he and his sisters began to procreate. So you're looking at a span of hundreds or thousands of years. Adam lived, you know, 900 years. And uh, in that period of time, I just said thousands, I mean, thousands of people, hundreds of years. Uh, in that period of time, as long as the sons of God, the children of Seth that were still true to God, as long as they remained separate from the daughters of Cain, many times in the Bible, it says the believers should not intermarry with the unbelievers, unbelievers so they're going to lose their distinctive faith. Everything was okay. But when the sons of God, the children of Seth, saw the daughters of Cain, the daughters of men, were fair. And that word men there means enos, they're mortal. They don't have eternal life. They began to intermarry. And right after it says that, it says, then wickedness became great in the earth and the thoughts of men's hearts were only uh, evil and violence. And it says, well, they had these great children, but that's not because aliens intermarried with humans. Um, you know, on earth, we see no example of procreation between species. So that that's you know very unlikely. And the Bible's really clear: angels do not marry. You know, we we don't need to ascribe to angels any sexual desire. There's nothing in the scriptures that says they procreate. They are all individually one by one created. Mm. And um, so um, the reason that the children were giants is something called genetic vitality. When the children of Seth began to intermarry with the children of Cain, you have a new genetic pool. And it's actually stronger. So it's a principle of genetic vitality. If you cross a lion and a tiger, you get a liger. That'll be bigger than a lion or a tiger. And so if you cross a, a zebra and a donkey, you get a zonkey. That will be bigger. Um, genetic vitality. So that's all that's saying is that they had these mighty children. Huh. Huh. Yeah. So it's not necessarily um, aliens that came no. down. It was de definitely just humans that were of different um understandings religiously yeah. okay yep. in first Thess thessalonians 4 17 ufologists have speculated that what many christians call the rapture will occur using vessels of beings that are not from earth could this be the case and what is the difference between the rapture and the second coming well according to first thessalonians it tells us that this is the second coming because it says in verse 16, you always have to read the context. Verse 16 says, The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ will rise. Then we, who, and this is verse 17, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them. So this is the same timing, same event, are being caught up with them. And it doesn't say they're spaceships, but the Bible does say, Jesus does say, he'll send forth his angels. I think that's Matthew 24. He'll send forth his angels to gather together his elect. We don't see anything in the Bible where angels need some kind of a man-made vehicle. Now, I don't know how they get us through space. They may put some kind of bubble shield around us or some kind of glory. I don't know. Um, there is an interesting account in the book of Daniel chapter 9 that tells us angels move through space very, very quickly. Huh. Because Daniel begins his prayer in chapter 9. By the end of the chapter, the angel Gabriel appears. And Gabriel says, at the beginning of your prayer, God told me to come. Wow. And so, you know, you go the uh, 90 seconds that it took him to pray the prayer. And that angel has gone from wherever God's dwelling place is all the way to earth. Much faster than the speed of light. We assume it would be like the speed of thought or something we don't understand right now. So they can move. You look at the immensity of space, and angels have to be able to move very, very quickly, or it take them forever to get anywhere. Huh, so a little amazing fact, uh, Brad. I ran into this last week. Is the fastest rocket ever made is being made now and should be ready in uh, January of 2022, and it's going to be um, the new lunar rocket, huh. which I think is going to go 24,000 miles an hour. 20. So. Uh, they're 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 increasing the the speed now and finding out ways to sling the the rockets much faster because that's our problem with space exploration is it takes forever to get to Mars or any of these planets. Yeah, you know that I was thinking about what you said earlier about how angels get from point A to B in space. 
kind of like a built-in bubble because it doesn't seem like they would be a spacecraft as we would imagine they would or imagine they would look like. This is just speculation, but what I've witnessed in God's creation is that God gives his creation what is necessary at creation because he thought of everything already. So it seems that God creates everything for the future. So in the future, the righteous will have their own form of space travel already built in. What do you think? There is a verse in uh, Isaiah, and I think it's Isaiah 42. I could be wrong. It says, uh, speaking of the redeemed, they will mount up with wings like eagles. So whether we, I don't think we're going to have eagles' wings, it's as like eagles. That means the best way he could explain it was, you know, we've got some kind of wings. And the fact that it says they'll mount up, uh, the redeemed are going to fly somehow. And I'm looking forward to that. But uh, yeah, I think that we'll be able to go through the cosmos. Right now, we don't interact with uh, other worlds because our planet's got a disease. So we're contagious. Mm -hmm. The only one who gets involved is the hospital staff. That'd be God and the angels. Mm -hmm. and, and so there's an unfallen universe out there that um, these beautiful creatures and once we're uh, once this world is recreated and we're purged of of evil we'll be able to interact with them freely and we're not going to be restricted to the planet i recently have been interacting with a lot of contractors cleaners roofers and chimney sweeps on my property and as they come into the studio they ask what i produce i tell them that i i'm connected to the dots between aliens and the bible and it's as it seems it might be a big deal in the future and I kid you not, every single one of them takes two steps forward towards me and use UFOs. That's exactly what I'm into right now. But I, when I try to tell them that this thing bears all the characteristics of demonic spiritualism, most Christians respond that there could also be good aliens. I think it has something to do with that ancient alien show on TV, but I can't refute their, their, their statements. So how do you, would you respond to something like that? Yeah, well, as I mentioned, I, I have no problem believing that um, there are good angels that have appeared to people. In uh, Hebrews, it tells us that um, some have entertained angels unaware. And the word angel simply means messenger. So there are times when, you know, the Bible talks about uh, different characters that have invited angels into their home. And so that's true. But we've got to keep in mind that the Bible also warns us they're not only good angels, there are some evil angels. And they may pose as aliens or leaders of other worlds or, you know, they can, I think it's Second Corinthians chapter 11, it says Satan himself is transformed into an angel. And that word angel means a messenger of light. So if people have to be careful, they say, you know, I saw this creature from another planet and it gave me a beautiful message uh, that said, it's okay to sin and you're just going to get reincarnated. And they're telling them something that is totally not true to deceive. But they'll think, well, it came from another world. It must be true. <laughs> but it could be a fallen angel. Yeah. So we got to be very careful to measure what the messages are by the Bible. We got to test the spirits, I guess, the, the Bible. Exactly. Says. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. You know, another reason, Brad, I think that people need to be careful about believing every extraterrestrial sign is Revelation tells us in the last days that this beast power that's going to bring about the final events uh, ha has power to make fire come down from heaven. And the people will be deceived by that. So here's this illusion that's created that some fire's coming down. And just before the Battle of Armageddon, Revelation 16 says these unclean spirits, they go and they perform signs and wonders. Hmm. And Jesus warns in the Gospel of Luke, and it's repeated in the book of Acts chapter, new, uh, chapter 2, that there will be signs in the heavens. And a lot of people are going to be seeing things in the skies in the last days. The Bible says that in prophecy. So we need to know what the truth is, what to believe and what not to believe, because mm -hmm. I think that uh, evil spirits are going to use that to manipulate people in the last days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Does the Bible indicate what, that God's people will go through trouble, or are they taken away from the trouble that's going to happen on earth? Well, Paul says in uh, Acts I believe it's chapter 27, he said, we must through tribulation enter the kingdom of God. I think everyone knows that in this life that there are trials, there's trouble. I mean, Jesus said, um, take up your cross and follow me. That means that there's some self-denial. And even whether a person believes or not, uh, even the wicked, they got trouble. <laughs> so there are trials. Uh, the children of Israel 
went through a tribulation, God did not save them from the tribulation. He saved them through the tribulation. So picture, if you will, you know, kind of a force field of angels. The Bible says the angel of the Lord encamps round about those that fear him and delivers them. The children of Israel were in Egypt when these plagues fell. Great time of trouble came on Egypt, but God protected them through the plagues. In the last days, God's people will be in the world. There's going to be a great tribulation. Jesus said, he that endures to the end will be saved. Uh, and the, the Bible tells us that um, there's going to be a great time of trouble such as there never has been. But we don't need to worry. The Bible says, at that time, thy people will be delivered. And that's uh, Daniel chapter 12. So, yeah, there's going to be a time of trouble. I don't think that he catches us up before the trouble. We are caught up right at the end before it gets really bad. The Bible says the earth is going to implode at the very end. Be an earthquake, great earthquake that will swallow islands, according to Revelation. And there'll be fire coming from heaven and great hailstones. And nature is just going to completely implode. At that point, the Lord catches us up. So... And, you know, we've just talked about how that happens, the mechanics of angels coming. Mm, mm. And the reason I ask that is because often I've heard it said, well, um, these beings will come and save us before anything bad happens. But, yeah, it's very interesting. So so um, speaking of people that are are influencing and this message, uh, influencers like Demi Lovato in UFOlogy say that the direct communication with these beings is obtained through Eastern meditation. Some have even said that the dead, their dead relatives have appeared to them and talked to them about this through this meditation. Does the Bible say anything about meditation and the communicating communion with these beings, or uh, is there examples in the Bible that demonstrate this? Yeah, see, that would be the portal when a, when a person is saying, I'm going to try to communicate with these uh, uh, aliens or otherworldly people. Um, the Bible says if you think you're communicating with the dead, that's what King Saul did in the Bible. He got a witch or a medium to try to consult them, and it was evil spirits that impersonated others. And Saul got a totally discouraging message and took his own life the next day. Mm. So it's very dangerous. The, the Bible is pretty clear. Do not try to communicate with the dead. You know, if you want to know something, talk to the Lord. We're not even told to pray to angels. Mm -hmm. uh, the Bible, once John was trying to pray to an angel, and the angel said, do not do that. Uh, you know, we're supposed to talk to God. Talk to God through Christ and through the Holy Spirit. God, God is not worn out. God is not like a switchboard operator that's too busy to talk to us. So the idea that we've got to go through these extraterrestrials or aliens or um, even angels, taught nowhere in the bible we go directly to god through christ mm. trying to communicate with uh, the dead is deadly and that's, you're entering on enchanted ground when you do that mm. 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 in ezekiel 1 it mentions that ezekiel saw figures resembling four living beings in human form with four mm -hmm. faces and four wings they appeared to have a body and faces like animals beside these animals was a sparkling blue wheel. I think uh, names a rock. So I looked up what the mm -hmm. color of the rock was I, and a wheel within a wheel. This is probably the most quoted verse in the Bible that ufologists say is of Ezekiel's viewing an alien ship. What is actually being presented here? See, when I, when I was doing this over and over again, Ezekiel came up. There's two, there's two uh, main things that, um, that they hit is Ezekiel and Enoch. And I think we're going to talk a little bit about Enoch in a second, mm -hmm. but what do you think about um, this wheel within a wheel? What is that talking about? Yeah, it's one of the great mysteries in the Bible. I have some ideas. Um, well, for one thing, the four creatures that are mentioned, you also find uh, very similar creatures in Revelation. And so um, you, you've got those four creatures, and Revelation is full of symbolism. So trying to make the things that are symbolic, literal, Revelation talks about a woman riding a dragon with seven heads and ten horns. Well, you know, some folks will probably say, oh, see, there's an alien right there. It, it, it tells us what those symbols represent later. There's a dragon in Revelation. We're told it symbolizes the devil. So when you read some of the, what they call the apocalyptic prophets in the Bible, like Daniel and Zechariah, Ezekiel, Revelation, they wrote with a lot of symbols. And so when Ezekiel talks about the wheel within the wheel, 
you know, that's sort of describing life. It's not just a spaceship is a pretty small interpretation of that. Um, every cell of life is a wheel within a wheel. You've got the nucleus inside the cell wall. You look at a galaxy and you've got solar systems, which are planets revolving around suns that are revolving around a galaxy. And you've got these pinwheels of wheels within wheels all through the cosmos. So pull out your telescope or pull out your microscope and you're going to find when you go down to the electrons and the neutrons and the protons to the galaxies in space, you're going to run into a wheel within a wheel. So this is one of the mysteries of God's you know, life. I, I to say, well, that he's describing a spaceship. Nobody climbs out of this wheel within a wheel that Ezekiel sees. He's seeing basically that God is moving and it's moving with him, meaning that God has everything orchestrated and he's in control and everything's precise. When you fly, uh, one of the things that gives you your attitude indication is a gyro. And the way a gyro works is it is a wheel within a wheel that when everything around it is turning, it stays stable. Huh. And so, you know, this is just showing that God's the stability of the universe that uh, God has all of these things under control. Hmm. Very interesting. I, yeah. I remember when I used to I'd read that and I said, the spaceship, what is that? Spaceship. <laughs> what is that? Yeah. Fascinating. Very good. So second Kings two, it mentions um, Elijah being taken to heaven in a whirlwind. Mm -hmm. in verse, verse 11, a chariot of fire with horses, of fire appear to both Elisha and Elijah and took Elijah away. It has been speculated that this is evidence of a close encounter. What are your thoughts? It was a close encounter. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's about as close as it gets because uh, Elijah and Elisha were walking together when suddenly, you know, the heavens part and this, um, you know, heavenly limousine, or, you know, he calls it chariots and horses of fire. Uh, comes down, separates the two of them, and scoops up Elijah and takes him a whirlwind, is the very word we'd use for like a tornado, a, a vortex of some sort, and takes him up into this vortex into heaven, and he disappears out of sight. Now, this happens to Jesus. When he ascends to heaven, he's caught up out of sight. Elisha, later in the same book, or it's actually in, yeah, Second Kings, same book, uh, Elisha's servant was worried that they were going to be conquered by the Syrian army that had surrounded them, and Elisha says, Lord, open his eyes. And all of a sudden, God gave Elisha's servant this supernatural vision. And he saw the Syrian army that was surrounding Elisha was surrounded with an, the mountains full of chariots and horses of fire. Hmm. Now, whether angels or God's army is marching around in you know, old Egyptian or Roman chariots with ponies, or is this the word that the prophets could use to best describe what they saw? I mean, they had no other vehicles that moved besides chariots. And the power that drove these chariots was horses. And even today we say horsepower. Well, there's not really horses under the hood. So uh, could, could he actually have a vision of a horse? Or could it have been a horse? Might have been. Revelation talks about Jesus coming on a white horse. But again, that's a, that's an apocalyptic vision in Revelation 19. So um, the, the Lord evidently has some conveyance that he used to scoop up Elijah. I'll, I'll give you one more thought on that, is that uh, the, the slaves had their theology straight when they sang that song, Swing Low Sweet Chariot. And how do they explain the chariot? It says, I looked over Jordan, and what did I see coming for to carry me home? A band full of angels was coming after me. So, you know, when the wise men saw the star, most people believe it was a band of angels. Mm. When the shepherds, the heavens were parted and they didn't realize all these angels were there, but their eyes were opened and the veil that separates the scene from the, the unseen was removed. So it happened to Elisha's servant. All of a sudden he could see the hills full of chariots and horses of fire. There's a whole unseen world out there that we don't know about. Whether they're really horses, or it's just the best way prophets can describe the creatures. Uh, I'll be happy when I find out uh, for myself. I don't know right now. Mm. Mm. Very good. So it, it's also been stated by uh, ufologists that the Bible doesn't mention dinosaurs. So if it doesn't mention UFOs, then maybe they are true. 
Does the Bible only reveal what is relevant for its time, or could there be more to our universe, that, like interspace travel? Well, certainly. Uh, I think the Bible reveals uh, you know, the most important things, but I think the Bible reveals things that we'll later understand that they were scientifically accurate and at the time people didn't know. You're not going to find in the Bible, don't smoke cigarettes. <laughs> well, they didn't have cigarettes when the Bible was written. I mean, if they wrote it, they wouldn't even have a word for it back then. So um, I think the Bible is usually dealing with principles. Now, the principle in the Bible is that God does have life outside of earth. That's pretty clear from, I mean, even if you stop at angels, I think it's way beyond angels, but God has life outside of earth. You read in the book of Job where uh, there's a meeting in heaven, the sons of God gather with the Lord, and it says, Satan comes, he's sort of representing our world. God says to the devil, where'd you come from? And Lucifer says, I've come from the earth. So there you've got a meeting with other intelligent creatures outside of earth. Mm-hmm. So the Bible reveals these things. Um, you know, Bible certainly doesn't say everything about everything because even the Bible says there's not enough books in the world to contain all knowledge. Mm. John says that. Hmm. 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 So there's a lot more out there that we don't know about. Oh, I'm sure. Hmm. So from what I've read, the, the book of Enoch was omitted in the council of Nicaea. Nicaea, is that how you say that? Mm-hmm. 323. AD, when the Bible was first assembled. But UFOlogists insist that the Book of Enoch holds the key to the understanding of UFOs from ancient days. Why was the Book of Enoch excluded, or should it be understood today? Yeah, the Book of Enoch is actually quoted once in the Bible by Jude. And, um, but, you know, there, there can be a statement. Paul also quotes Greek uh, poets, but that doesn't mean every Greek poet is supposed to be part of the Bible. <laughs> so, um, the book of Enoch uh, clearly was not written by Enoch, because if you know your Bible history, Enoch lived before the flood. Mm. That would mean Enoch needed to write a book before there's any record there was writing. People had such uh, prodigious memories before the flood. They lived hundreds of years. Everything was transmitted orally. And um, there's no record, no mention of the book of Enoch anywhere until you get after the Babylonian captivity. So most scholars believe that the book of Enoch was a, a, a person wrote it and it's like, um, you know, Mark Twain, his name was not really Mark Twain. It was Samuel Clemens, but he used the pen name Mark Twain. And uh, Ben Franklin developed a, a book in a magazine called Poor Richard's Almanac. He, he, his name was Ben Franklin, but he wrote it under the pseudonym of Poor Richard. Back during the Babylonian captivity, someone wrote uh, an inspiring book. And he said it was from Enoch, the book of Enoch, because all the Jews believed Enoch was a holy man. Now, there may be some inspiring statements in the book, but um, I think there's some things I've read. I've not read the whole book of Enoch, but I've read some beside what's in the Bible. And um, yeah, they just don't match up with the Bible. So I think that if you're basing your understanding of truth on the book of Enoch, which is called an apocryphal book, kind of appears out of nowhere. Um, I think that's sort of dubious. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So the Book of Enoch was excluded by the council because it just didn't line up with the rest of... Yeah, it doesn't match with the rest of Scripture, and there's contradictory things in it. Mm. You know, they just felt it was an uninspired book. Mm. Mm. So according to ufologists, Sumerians are the oldest civilization recorded on Earth, and much of the ufology is based on the teachings found in their hieroglyphics. Mm-hmm. Does the Bible indicate anything about these people? Are they followers of God, or does it say anything about them? Well, these are the people that lived in Mesopotamia, if I'm not mistaken, the Sumerians, and uh, very closely related with the Babylonians and Chaldeans. Um, they, they were brilliant stargazers. Uh, it was people from the East called the Magi. They studied uh, astronomy, as well as other sciences, they came looking for Jesus from reading the prophecies of Balaam. And so um, there's a lot of wisdom there. Um, you know, even people who trace DNA history are at odds about when you trace back the history of man. Right now, there's two schools. One school says that the man originated in Central Africa. The other school is saying the DNA points to Mesopotamia. Now, the Bible supports that it started in Mesopotamia where the Tower of Babel was and civilization fanned out from there. 
So there's a lot of wisdom that just culminated through the centuries. That doesn't mean all that they had was true. God called Abraham out of that area because they were worshiping, you know, stones and rocks and pagan. They got into paganism and pantheism, worshiping nature. And God said, uh, that's wrong. It's just not true. Fascinating. Very, very It doesn't mean, I mean, the Egyptians, they built the pyramids, but the Egyptians who built the pyramids in their book of the dead, you know, they had all these medical secrets. They said that uh, worm's blood will make your hair grow. They had a lot of really crazy ideas, <laughs> just like in our world today. I mean, we've got incredible technology in our world today, but we've also got some people with some pretty crazy ideas mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that are, you know, just not why, not much more than wives' tales. Yeah, right. But yeah. the Sumerians had some wisdom, but uh, they also, I think, had some uh, some zany ideas. It's like any culture, I guess. Yeah. 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 Very good. Um, do you have any resources that um, you would like to share with our audience that might be interested in this topic? Yeah, well, thank you very much. Uh, you know, we have a website called Amazing Facts. And at the Amazing Facts website, we've got a lot of resources you can read. Uh, we've got a resource that talk about spirits from other worlds. And uh, we've got a book that talks about the, it's called uh, Aliens Adopted or Angels. And it's saying, who are these sons of God that you find in uh, Revelation chapter six? Hmm. And if people read the book, I think they're going to see what the answer is to that. So they go to the Amazing Facts website. I think they'll see a lot of resources there that help explain some of what we've been talking about. You know, one, one study that um, caught my eye when I was on your website was uh, the Colossal City from Space, I think is a study guide, yeah. isn't it? Yes. And I, that, of course, talks about the space city. The space city. Yeah, very good. Uh, the uh, the graphic came to my mind. Wonderful. Well, I'm so glad to have you uh, on the show. And uh, hopefully we'll have you on the show very soon, especially if these strange events become even more normal part of our life. Thank you so much, Brad. It was a privilege. Friends, don't forget your part in spreading this message, like liking, sharing, commenting, and subscribing, as this really helped the algorithm spread the truth found in this channel. The more people we have comment, the more people we have subscribe, the more it gets shared in the SERPs, the search engine pages on YouTube. Thanks for what you do, and see you next time.